Happy Wednesday. Look who I have in the house with me again, fan favorite, Matt Parise. Matt, hello, you're like hello. a celebrity now. People will say to me, hey, have Matt do a best practice on this. So the list is getting long of requests, just so you know. I know you don't have anything else to do, but hang out with me on Facebook Live. But the list is getting very long. I like it. I know. So how are you doing this Wednesday? Tell me about your trip to Disney. I am doing good. Um, it was pretty excellent. I know we talked about it a little bit in one of the prior ones, but really good trip. Missing it now. Uh, we got snow just this past weekend. So um, crazy enough. Or I think it was Thursday. We got snow in the morning. So it was pretty crazy. It's, yeah, I'm in Indy. We have a, a freeze warning and we're supposed to get some snow. It's just, this always goes on in the lawn care world. It's like you get ramped up and the guys, the technicians, as you know, they actually like it because it's like, okay, I get one day of respite and then they got to hit it again. It, it does kind of, the phones will slow down because customers, even though they're looking at dandelions, are like, wait, there's frost on my dandelion. I'm not sure about that. So today's best practice is on call log. And we had a few questions about it. You were kind enough to help one of my uh, favorite customers talk through it. And I said, Matt, I learned things in your explanation to this person. And I've used call log since 1999. And in the old days, you could resolve it. <laughs> here's the call log. Here's the resolution date. We didn't even have reasons and the way that product has evolved has just been unbelievable. Steve Katz and his team, and now Caitlin Pomeroy and the product team. It is really a best-in-class CRM tool. I compare it to Salesforce, HubSpot, a lot of others. Our call log is very, very, very powerful. A lot of our customers think, oh, if a customer calls in, it really replaced the old pink notes we used to have. We're going to use it for a follow-up tool, but I know when I was using it, I used it for campaigns of all types, collections, upsells uh, for years and years. So you are going to share with us today some tips and tricks on call log. Take it away. Sure thing. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, so let me get my screen up here. And Beth, if you could pass presenter on to me. I can do that. make host you are now the host all right and we can see the screen okay there oh yeah all right excellent so call log so we're going to kind of start with some of the basics here and then we'll move into some of the things that you can definitely implement to try to utilize in a better manner for you the most important thing that i like to start off with with the call log is understanding that it's not going to be cut and paste for everyone. Everyone has different circumstances, different sort of situations that they need to utilize the call log for. So we'll kind of start with that. Um, the big piece here that I want to kind of mention is depending upon the individual that we're logged in, the first key component of the call log is that we do have our filters that associate with this to set that up for that corresponding user. So again, independent per each user, we have our call log filters here, which we can see on the left-hand side if we see that little filter icon. And once you click there, this is gonna bring up our panel here on the side, which is really gonna dictate what we're viewing in that call log. So we're gonna kind of dive through this piece here. So starting from that first filter, hide calls due after a certain number of hours. So this is an input box here. So we can actually just drop in the number of hours. So if you know you have a large influx of calls in your call logs and you're not worried about any of them that are due five days from now, you could in theory come in here and put in an hour amount, um, 24 hours, 48 hours whatever you would like to see. So when that call becomes due within 48 hours, we could have it pop up as opposed to clutter our call log in the current point in time. So there's our very, very first filter. Um, the next three filters are straightforward. Date entered, date complete, due date. If you're unsure of where to select these, all is gonna be your best option to make sure we're not missing anything based on specific date criteria. But I do recommend all as a general there on the vast majority of these, especially date entered in case someone happens to open up an old existing call log on the account. We don't want to be filtering out simply due to the fact that 
this call log was from a year ago if somebody resurfaces it. So it's really important that we have our date criteria structured here. It doesn't always have to be all, but it does work for the vast majority um, to kick it off, especially if we're resurfacing old call logs in any regard. Moving down to our call log statuses, which we'll get into a bit more in depth about how to set these up and how to map them accordingly. But we do have our call log status drop down here. Now it's really easy to filter initially here. Um, if we wanna filter our unresolved, we can just click our unresolved option up top here. Um, if we wanted to grab anything else, we have the ability to, but we do have those overarching filters up top here to just select all those call logs of that particular type there. Then we have our resolved call logs here, which are typically the ones you're not going to view in your call log to start off with. So when we look at unresolved versus resolved, the, the terminology is pretty straightforward to start off with, but what dictates a call from being unresolved versus resolved? And it's really, really simple to sort of understand that piece. And we're gonna stray from the filters for a moment to kind of discuss that. But within settings, and under our call log setup here, right there in the middle center, we can see that in our call log setup, we could see all the call log statuses that exist for our current database structure here. Now, the big key indicator here that we were just referring to was our resolved checkbox here. So what this is dictating is that that call is in theory resolved. So the best way I like to explain unresolved versus resolved sort of statuses here is you initially get a request for whatever it may be. Let's say a customer wants an estimate. Customer calls um, about changing a service. Customer calls about this or that. So it always starts with an initial sort of purpose, that call, whether they reached out about services, whether they reached out about their bill, whether they reached out about anything. It always starts with what we consider an unresolved status. And all of those unresolved statuses are the ones that we can see here without check marks. Now, all of those root issues, causes, whatever it may be, wants, needs from that unresolved call log, the end goal is to resolve that call out. But it's important to understand what resolved call log status you're utilizing and if you have any intentions with it after the fact. So if we took this call, it's unresolved, and then we are taking action on it. Does it require us to run any type of reporting against it? Is just us doing the estimate and documenting all that on the account sufficient enough? Or do we wanna follow up and even track where these things are according to our call log? So we have different routes to handle those as well. But the key component that I really wanna hit hard there is you always start with a root unresolved issue, problem, situation that always needs to be resolved in theory. So whether the customer calls and requests an estimate, even if you don't follow through and make that sale, that call is in still in theory resolved. We need to drop that call off. That call sits there stagnant. I see it far too frequent where we have any of those estimates sort of sit there static. There is no sort of follow-up process associated with them. Then they remain in this call log status tied to the account if you're utilizing them in that fashion without actually making any shifts. So it becomes really, really important to sort of hit those key components and understand, first off, do we have everything in this list that we actually need for our intended purposes? Are we using this for collections? Are we using this for campaigns? Are we running reports and exporting to a call log? There's a ton of different outlets to get material into your call log. CAW integrates directly with that to send over any of that information from the contact us requests or any of those associated with CAW. And we get all of that information and we need to understand if we have all the call logs associated. And just one of the big things, Beth, that I see is just internal office sort of training associated with that. So once they lock down what they're looking for, what sort of scenarios they have, it's locking that process down so we don't have employees in the office going their own rogue path, not following our intended sort of design with the call log setup on the real green side, in addition to the call log setup that they've sort of extended and drafted their own outline, essentially. Makes sense. So with that, 
here's kind of our basic setup page here. So as far as our statuses, I really wanted to kind of show you the resolved and get into the different sort of key components, which dictates a unresolved versus resolved there. But moving back to our call log now, we'll sort of continue down our filter. So we talked about our call log statuses, our unresolved versus resolved, which we've seen. Now, our next option is going to be read versus unread calls. Now, I highly suggest that you have one of the two options selected here. So either both of them or neither of them, unless you have a specific, very specific use case in the call log there. So the main component with this option, and I see this from time to time here, and this is the red unread, unread calls selection here. Selecting nothing is just like selecting all as well as selecting both. But if you're selecting one or the other, like just unread calls, the second you technically read that call, it's gonna drop off your call log. So it may work well for some upper management to just review what's in there. So once they view it, they kind of drops off and know that it's handled. But for those of you that are taking any action on the call logs, you're gonna to wanna to either have both selected or neither selected in this instance, which neither is both of them. Next option is our subject. So if you would like to further sort of filter out your call logs and give them sort of a subcategory, you have the ability to utilize subject, which essentially is going to give you sort of that breakdown where we have a collection call, but that you code that collection call as a certain subject. So maybe it's high risk, low risk, um, a different route there for your subject. Flags are just gonna give you the ability to sort for any of those flags. Now, keeping in mind, if I select that I'm looking for individuals with the do not raise flag call log, it is still going to filter based on all the criteria that I have up top here. So depending upon where my filters are at, just because I select that flag code, it's only going to further filter the list that we have in place. Our next option is customer status. This one operates much the same as sort of red unread calls here. If we leave it unselected, we're gonna be able to view everything. If we select certain st statuses here, you do have the potential to sort of limit what you're seeing there. So just keep in mind, this is going to pull from the customer status itself there. And if you're filtering for any of these customer statuses, if not all of them, you have the potential to miss some calls that are for a customer that are in another status. Now, if you only deal with active customers, totally understand. You can by all means filter for active customers. But one of the key components I like to mention there is if we're just filtering for active customers, if we have a call log for whatever reason that's not directly tied to a customer's account, we may be missing that call log. So I like to hit a couple of those key components there so you understand sort of completely the, the full circle and the implications of your different selections there. Our last couple options here, pop-up notification employee filter. If we're looking for notifications of any of these employees receiving calls, we can select them from our list here. And then we have our notify me when these employees get a new call option there, which will also notify you there if you're managing in a, a team amongst the call log or any other routes there. And our last option, save as default settings, which is extremely important. So we could set everything how we want it here, click apply, and we're gonna see those results. If we would like to see those results the next time we actually come to the call log or refresh or open up that tab, we're going to want to save as default settings with each of the changes we make. So really important from the filter perspective to do so. Now there's, Another important perspective from our call log filters right below it is our call log sorting. So this is all gonna be user preference here. Um, and this just dictates if we wanna see new calls at the top, new calls at the bottom. Do we wanna start with the oldest first? And then what is our priority for sorting within the call log? And a lot of individuals don't know that this is actually possible, but you can sort based on the order that exists here. So if Enter date is not the most important criteria that I want to sort by, and it's always status. I can always drag status up above enter date there. Again, very similar to our call log filters, like we talked about, where we could save as default settings and apply. And then that will sort accordingly. As you can see, it groups them all by status. And then we can flip those around as well. Um, each of those arrow keys indicates that we can slide this in a different direction so we can flip completely. So if we're looking by, once again, um, 
balance, let's say we can show the highest at the top if you're using it specifically for aging. So there's a lot of really cool key factors that you can do from our filters alone, um, short of utilizing the call log here. So now actually, since we understand kind of the background setup for our call log here, we have our call log filter, setting those is gonna be the most important thing. Even if we're not utilizing them at the current point in time, if you do get something, if you're using CAW, you're gonna wanna have your call logs filtered here. Now, a very, very, very important aspect of this, as we can see up top, is that we have our employees there. So this is gonna dictate who we're actually seeing those call logs for in the call log. So we could see everything assigned to myself here in this test database, but we can add additional employees from the call log. And then those call logs will filter in here as well. I don't know if we have anybody. So Matt, you, this is who has visibility to Matt Parise's call logs. Correct. Yeah. So this is logged in as Matt Paris here, but if you're a corporate security level user, essentially, and you have visibility to see your other employees, then you have the ability. And it's actually a security level setting where you can toggle whether or not they can view other call employees call logs. So nice option there, but the, the key component up top here beyond seeing other employees is that if you are utilizing CAW, and we're going to flip over to that admin page here for a second, where in the company parameters section, and you can see our company parameters section, we have the ability in the call log tab to actually flip over the employees that each of these call logs are going to, and we have the ability to select the outcome. So this is by far one of the things I see the most frequent with the current setup that we see right now. So everything coded as new call, there's no division amongst any of those things coming back from CAW. And we have both the ability to dictate both of those settings, which is extremely awesome as far as utilizing them. So maybe we create new call log statuses, maybe we create different outcomes, whatever it may be, we have the ability to script all of those call logs and put them in place for different actions that occur via CAW. And one question, Matt, I get this a lot. Let's say it's mid-year because it is mid-season and I want to make tweaks to this. Some, some aspects of parameters, the way you set up jobs and programs, that can have some downstream impacts. But if I decide I want to add new call logs, new outcomes mid-season, is there any impact on what what happens to maybe the historical data? So adding new ones, um, not going to have an impact on historical data, but if we're remapping, um, remapping the call log outcome or call log status, if we were to say, go to our call log setup here, and we decided that we don't want new call to be new call anymore. If we were to rename new call, it will historically change everything from the past from new call to whatever we define this new status. So very important to understand that perspective. If we add anything, it's just like adding anything else. We'll now have that option available for us for selection. But if we're remapping anything, very, very important to understand that it will change all the historical data if we are renaming any of the current naming conventions. And that makes sense. Yeah, so an important piece to remember, but we can, again, as we remember, uh, recreate new ones. And as I've mentioned with several of these other ones, a lot of the cool little things that I don't see individuals take advantage of often is the color coding. So color coding any of those call logs, so they're straightforward, um, extremely important from the call log setup perspective. But Back to our CAW page, a very, very important component of this is that we have the all of these different actions that exist. So if we have everything coming over as new call, it allows us to filter through it, of course, um, and then we can continue on. And that may be the, the best method. Maybe we only get a couple requests a day through CAW because we're on the smaller side. But as you start to ramp up, it becomes important to really sort of manage those, uh, those contacts sort of requests that come through, any services that are added, what do you want visibility on? So I always say one of the main things I recommend is coming into CAW admin, general setup, our company parameters, and then we're going to go to the call log tab here, and you have the ability to remap any of these. So one of the things that I would say right off the bat, if we're going to change nothing, here's the one thing to change, 
is the stuff in relation to our payments there. So if we're using our GPP, really important that we have uh, the ability to track those payments that came in, but our payments that did not run. So having these come in looking identical as just the payments can, in, in my opinion, be problematic. You can, you know, misread unsuccessful versus successful auto pay or something like that um, when you're just simply looking at text. But one of the things we could do for payment rejected, say, is we code this as urgent. Then it's a red call log. It prioritizes up at the top. We have a bunch of different routes to take this. And even beyond the call log, one of the things in CAW admin set up to the far right is actually mapping your a, a particular email address that you would like those sent to as well. So in addition to getting the call log in service assistant, we can actually send it to an email as well, that same information. So if it's super critical and you're not in service assistant throughout the day, then we can say any of these payment rejected, send us an email notification. So it, it works well. And one of the things, again, that I just don't see enough of the individuals mapping these. So it's, it's an important piece there, especially if we're capturing maybe NPS scores as well. Um, with those NPS score captures that we have on the CAW site that you can toggle on or off, um, if there's a particular score set that we want to code as a different color, different call log status, we have the ability to do so as well. And then not to mention the employee from the listing here, we can map this to any employee. So if there's a certain department or individual who handles this versus that, we can just send it directly to them as opposed to all of them coming over as CAW. Now, one thing I will mention is that I really do like the CAW component of this because it's a very clear indicator of what came from CAW versus what came through the phone system or something like that. So a, a CAW employee in this spot is a really an excellent solution there. Now, one of the key components here, just to kind of harp on this piece, is that if we are creating a new employee, let's say, because we are going to revamp our call log because we decided this is the path that we're going to take is that this employee requires a security level, whatever it may be, to actually utilize it in that fashion. So I'd just like to highlight that piece. And if we were to add an employee in there right off the bat, just if, again, if anyone's going to sort of try this piece, um, that it does require sort of a sync in order to see that employee there. So if we're mapping this right now, you're not going to be able to see it in CAW two minutes from now. You're going to have to wait that 30 minutes or so to actually see that employee. It's there, about so. 30 minutes that CAW syncs, right? Correct. Yeah. So just want to kind of highlight that piece because it's extremely important to sort of note that, especially if we're going to go in there, create this employee, and then be looking for it right away. Just want to bring that to light. Now into the call log. So from our CAW information there, now we have our call log. So again, base overview, we have the ability to get to our call log up top here. And we're going to have our call log listing here based upon our filters that we have predefined there. So one of the main things here from any of these calls, and we'll go ahead and click on any of these calls that exist, we can see the call. We're going to get a lot of important information essentially. So starting from the top here, we're going to see the call log status here. And one of the important things is understanding that this is actually clickable and we can switch that top one to another status without issue right there from the top. So we have the ability to toggle that there. If we were to make the change, we make whatever change it's going to be and you can hit that check mark. Simplest way to change the call log status there. Now, up top here, we're going to have a couple different options and buttons up top. So place in use, place in use is going to put that call in use and it's going to indicate the call is busy. Um, and this is intended for when you're on that call to sort of track the length of the time you are on that call. So if you are taking this call, reaching out to the employee or reaching out to the customer, you can mark this call in use for that time period. And then when you code it to the next status essentially, or drop your notes in there, it will end that timestamp essentially. So up top here, um, beyond that, we have our new call log entry. So we can create a new call log for this customer if we wanted, our delete call log, and then our call log detail report option there. So we have a couple different options right up at the top. We talked subjects prior, but we can map our subjects here even after the fact if necessary. 
So we have our subjects there that we can choose and that operates in the same manner. Choose from the drop down and hit the checkbox there. And over here, we have our main customer details. Now the main component here to kind of touch on first is this phone number here is what we consider sort of the preferred phone number. So of course you have the option there where you have that home phone number, cell phone number that's already on the account. But when you're entering a call log on a customer's account, let's say, and here's a test customer's account, we can hit that new call log entry in the top left corner there. And once we actually hit that entry, it's gonna populate whatever phone number is primary on their account. But given that they don't have a phone number on their account, we can populate that information. And once that information is populated, it'll be called what's considered the preferred phone number. So even if they just have a cell or home on their account, and then for whatever reason, they they call in and something else gets documented there, that number still gets stored in the call log, at least there. So we know what number to reach back out to. But that's if we're putting that call on, just an important aspect of that. So we have that. So if we click more, we can see the preferred is sometime mapping with what phone is actually tied to their account, but preferred is the number that they're requesting they get a call back essentially. And that is sort of the intended design. Next below that, we do have an add service button. If we wanted to open this account, we could click the customer number here. It's gonna open that account directly up. Um, like I mentioned, we have our add service option, which will take you to the add service utility there and are assigned to so who this is actually assigned to so another important aspect of this from the assigning is we can add additional individuals onto the call so we have matthew paris coded to this call if at any point i want to transfer this call over to somebody else in the organization i could click here and then once i am there i can send this over to someone else hit the check mark and then this call is out of my call log in theory, because now it is assigned to Jeffrey. So if I refresh, we lose that call log from our left listing. We still see the call log up here if we needed to make any notes still, and we transferred it a little early. Um, but the second that we completely refresh our call log, um, if we were to regenerate it, we will lose visibility of this call after we've transferred it. So just be mindful of that. Any of the dates that exist on those calls are going to be documented in our date section there. So if it was entered, if it's already been resolved and unresolved there, we'll get those indications here. And then if it has any due dates, the due dates are indicated as well. Now, up top and sort of the full life cycle of this call here, and we'll open up another one, we have sort of the call log structure here. So up top, we can see what that call log actually is. So if any of these are coming from CAW, let's say it's a payment successful message, we're gonna get a payment successful message here. And then we're gonna be able to see that indication there for this call log. Now, if nothing is required from that, so if a payment is successful, we can code it as a certain unresolved status to take action on it just to note that we've seen it, but is it truly required? No. So that kind of goes back to the call log mapping piece there where you can actually code things directly into a resolve status. So it stores on the account, but it may not be something that actually requires any action. So another important component of that. But we start with our new call and we could say this issue is whatever it may be. Um, customer requests an estimate. So, and, and you can edit your text. It is a security setting there for editing your own text. You wouldn't be able to edit the text of users without other users without those permissions. But let's say customer requests an estimate. So after we lock that in, um, so we get this new call log. So as I mentioned before, we have a new call status there. So first off, we can code any of those new estimates in our own status if we want. So if new call is too vague for us and we have way too many calls coming in, we can start off by getting our estimates sent over in a new status. So maybe new call estimate. Um, we can code it as something as simple as that. So I like to kind of be mindful of that option there where we can remap any of those to start off with. Now, as I sort of precursed before, we have our new call, uh, our new call here, and that started starting our issue that needs to be resolved, whether it's an issue or request, whatever it may be. So customer requested an estimate. Now I don't have much details in here, but basically the customer would like to be reached out to get an estimate here. 
So whether we're doing online measurement, whatever it may be, what are the next steps here? And this is where you could kind of draft how you're going to utilize that call log there. Does employee one take that, reach out to the customer and figure out what they're looking for? Then what are the next steps of our call log there? With the ultimate goal of this being getting that estimate accepted, an active customer at that point in time, or maybe getting an estimate rejected. We have sort of two outcomes there, or maybe they're unresponsive after we give them an estimate. So there's a couple different paths there. And then it's really scripting how specific we want to be with that. So is it, we got a new estimate and here's the path we want to go with this. Um, or estimate provided and we close that call out as resolved. Is there certain indications that we want to do to track that throughout? So with that new call, we're starting with new call again. We can create whatever we want if we want to bring our estimates into a different status, but we can still start with any status here. Now, as we work through sort of the life cycle of this, and maybe for your organization, one person does all this. So there may not be a ton that they need to utilize through the call log. But if say we have multiple people within the organization that have their hands in this estimate, we have the main individual who takes the first request. We have the individual who schedules the estimate. We have the individual who does the estimate. There's a lot of different pieces to that. So we do have the ability to not only add additional individuals on the call log here, so we can give them visibility on what this is, but we also have the ability to insert any of those notes there. So if it, it was a situation where we reached out to the customer and they didn't respond, um, we have a couple different outlets here. And this is just a, a specific example here, but if we throw in notes on our call, we can map it to what we consider sort of an outcome here. Now, we're gonna go into outcome here in a second and we'll, we'll keep it all relatively simplistic here, but I just wanna sort of elaborate on this piece where we're looking for any of these statuses. You can redefine whatever you want. So it's finding whatever your use case is for the call log and then sort of adapting it. But the general workflow, incoming unresolved call, take the actions to resolve that call there. So. New call, reached out, but no response. So we can do a couple things. We can code them in callback or called no answer. And as you can see, sort of the outcome here, because it doesn't have its own defined outcome on this call log status, it keeps it at new call. So here's what happened. We reached out, no response, still keeps that call in our call log for us. Now there's some other situations here where we can go callback and you'll notice that our status actually changed here. And this is one of the, the biggest questions I get on the call log here is where is this information coming from? So we talked about this piece, we touched on it earlier here. Um, well, we touched on our call log setup, which is just dictating whether it's resolved versus unresolved. And then we have our call log outcome here. So as we mentioned with our estimate, there's a couple different outlets. So we could start with, we gave them this estimate and they took it, we made the sale. And then again, there's that other outlet where they rejected that estimate, or maybe there's another outlet where it's unresolved um, or they're unresponsive. So in theory, we have what I would consider sort of three different resolve statuses from a very basic example there. Now, what we have the ability to do here is actually map different call log outcomes. So what this looks like is dependent upon the outcome of that call, you can document what that outcome is and auto pop a status. So if we were to auto pop any of these statuses, so we reached out to the customer, something like left message is auto popping a status that's left message. Most of these are one-to-one -one mapping here where it's, it's its own status, but I also want it to be its own outcome. But something like resolved, which is its own status here for simplicity for users when they first get in there, we can, in theory, take a resolved call where we have resolved rejected versus resolved sold and then filter them all to one status, in theory, resolved. So we have our call log mapping. In theory, those are all resolved statuses, but they're different types, essentially. So one actually made a sale, one did it. And we can filter them all to resolved and everything will be just fine unless we want to do any call log reporting after the fact. And that is where that becomes important, where if we filter them all into the same resolved singular status, that works great for getting those call logs out, keeping everything documented on the customer's account. But it really does lapse in the area 
where we're just simply not going to have that information anymore. If we don't have it, there's no way to run reports against it. And if we don't have a status there for a particular situation that we're looking for, then we just simply don't have it there unless we create it. But with each of these outcomes here, we have the ability to have that outcome and we have the ability to have a status map to it. And these can be called whatever you want. As you can see up top, it's just a description. And then we can map that corresponding status to it. So if it's resolved, um, we can do so. But if we want to have our own sort of status here, maybe it's collection call res resolved. We can filter those into our own specific category there. But really important, if you're unfamiliar with this, this is in settings. And then it is right here for our call log outcomes there. And you'll see everything that's predefined already that exists here and what it's actually mapped to. And like I said, the vast majority of them are going to be one-to-one. -one. You don't technically have to have mappings for all of them if there is a variety of potential outcomes with those. So if it was a personal call, and there's no particular status that a personal call results in, then we can actually have this null here and then decide what that status is going to be each time manually. So with our call log outcome, it's just really important that these are mapped and you understand where they're coming from. Because it is far too often that I see individuals choose from here and they don't know why it's populating this information right here. And that is directly coming from that area right there. But that is sort of the first piece here. So if we call busy, whatever it may be, and if we document this here, what this is going to do is reach out there. You'll see that it still keeps it in the same call log status, but we have the ability to show system notes here where it'll say that it changed from our new call to busy and then from our busy to new call, where it's not directly capturing sort of that outcome there where we talked about because what's happening is that outcome resulted in the new call status. So there wasn't in theory a real status switch. So that's why I think it's really important to map out those outcomes. This way we know the resolved status of each of these or whatever actions we're taking. And then if we're working within organizations, I can do whatever action I have on whatever that initial call I fielded was and transfer this call over to somebody else or add somebody else for visibility. And they can continue to document there as well. Now, the ultimate goal of this, again, is to resolve this. So whatever it may be, maybe we did reach out, estimate provided, we're going to have any of those resolved statuses like we talked about. And with our resolved statuses here, this is where it's clear on the indication if we're set up properly and the whole organization understands where to map this, then if we were to review any of these calls in whatever current status they were, you could get a good overlay of, okay, we have 40 calls in the estimate process right now. Now that's outside of even the process that we have from sort of your estimate summary reports and running all those in association with this. But this will allow you to kind of see where your employees are at with these at a given time, as opposed to just looking for an estimate given or printed date. Um, and this is just for the sake of tracking estimates through here. We kind of have that process there, but this is where I go back to that point that I think is far too important here. Um, just mapping what those processes are going to be. So if we start using this for, let's say, estimates in this basic example I have, maybe we reach out to the customer and if they don't come back to us or we can't get a hold of them, do we have any sort of frequency on when we're going to revisit that? Are we closing the call out and creating a new one? I like to keep that first call open, document any of the notes that we had throughout that call. So you have one call log entry for the entirety of that. Even if you reached out to that customer 12 times, called, left voicemail, you have that note indicated on each of those. So you can track back through the responses at any point in time through one call log instead of scattered throughout that customer's account there. So that's kind of where that comes in. And then as you can see on the left, I'm not sure if you caught that, but the call log does auto sort of refresh periodically throughout the day. It's roughly every five minutes there. So you'll kind of see that this call is currently in busy because it's in use. So you can see that that call just shifted. So just wanted to kind of draw attention to that as well, as I just seen that out of the corner of my eye here. Um, but once we get to that point, it's resolved whatever actions took there. And then once that's done, we can save out that call log. 
it's going to document whatever that status is, change our status up here based on our outcome that existed. Then once we get there, if we were to pull up this customer's account at any point in time, that call log is stored on the contact tab of their account now. So we have that call log. If we were to open that call log at any point, we could expand and then see any of those things that existed on this customer here. So we have that call log. We can see all of our different responses here, but we can expand for more details as well. But any of those historical call logs there are stored on the customer's account and they're not scattered. So it's not employee one did this action. There's its own independent call log. If we're doing an estimate or using this for collections, um, we have the ability to grab all that information, run wild with it, and then document. Once that call is resolved, we can close it out. Matt, Again, I realized in the pioneer days when I trained customer service teams, we were flying blind because we used pink notes. And when they said, I called you Thursday and Robbie hasn't called me back, we just had to go, okay, we're sorry. Second call, Robbie. This is just a cornucopia of knowledge if you're in customer service, if you're in sales and customer satisfaction. Like you can tie retention to how well do we do basic follow-up, basic blocking and tackling when you use call log correctly. Sure thing, yeah. And it's, it, it, I think a lot of individuals in all honesty, Beth, just kind of overcomplicate it. it. It really comes down to what is that starting need for that? Why is the call created? It's going to be the customer wants something, needs something, requests something. What is our follow-up action of that? So if you think of it from the most simplest form, we have that initial request. And then first off, how are we receiving those requests? So remapping CAW, restructuring our call logs. Is this how we want to see those calls in that? I know if it's something that I want to be alerted to, I want it read. I want it front and center for me. So that's just my preference there. Um, if everything's just a sea of new calls here, then it can be a bit more tedious. And if we're looking through a bunch that our customer made a payment and the payment was successful, then we may not want to filter through all those where we could be missing some of that important stuff. So if you remember getting that information over properly is the first important part and then tracking any of these notes. I see a lot of companies create several different calls for each of these which may work for their scenario. If it's, this is the end of the life cycle for them, this is the end of the life cycle for this call for them, then we're golden with that. But if it's something that requires action from a couple different parties and each of them is dependent upon the other, kind of utilizing that same call log is important um, just so we can track, we have all the notes internally there and then they all store in one record on the account. But it's whatever that perceived initial action is and then whatever the action to resolve it is, and then how do we want to view that information? If you have no desire to run call log reports, that may be your answer right now. But what about two years from now? Does it hurt to just map a couple statuses in the way that you want them? So really, really simple process. And then any of those creation pieces, call log status setup, really easy to create, define a code, description. Is it a resolved status or not? And do you want to be able to see that status on mobile live? And our color selections, if we're good there, then we can move over to our next step, which is that call log outcome. And we can take any of those new statuses and map them to an outcome. Is the outcome in theory the status? Maybe. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Whatever makes the most sense to you. And as long as you understand when I choose this resolved or this outcome, what is the status it's going to portray? If there isn't, and in these two examples, there isn't a status here it's going to keep it at whatever status the call currently is. So if I choose this action and I don't have a map status to it, is not only everybody in the organization gonna understand that or should we map it and make sure everything's pretty straightforward and we can define that process internally. So it just kind of helps. You take care of a couple of these key components. You start with that initial call, you close out that initial call with an action all of the actions in theory being resolved, whether the resolved outcome was in your favor, meaning a sale occurred or not in your favor, estimate rejected there. Or even if they're unresponsive, do you have an unresponsive workflow to capture those? They didn't answer. How, when do we call back? Is it tomorrow, two days from now? What's sort of your frequency on a, on a left open estimate? And that kind of ties back to your customer's accounts too. So if we're taking action, they're an estimate status, the estimate gets rejected, 
making sure we document that appropriately on the customer's account so we can see the different actions that occurred. So we have this nice call log with all the details. Customer's account is in a, in a nice status there. So if we try to catch pitch not sold from last year, now we have all the documentation that we did from this year. So we could talk about all the times we contacted them, had everything there. So it's just a really nice way to sort of track any of those pieces here. And I'll leave you on one note here before we sort of part ways here. If you're not going to use the call log, um, one of the simplest sort of features that exists here, and it is using the call log in theory, is if you're doing nothing, if you're on a customer's account, when they call in, you open up their customer's account. If you just click this new note here on the left-hand side, you can type whatever you want there and it'll store it as note status on the customer's account there. So if we just do something like this, really simple. And if you're not even using the call log, this is kind of the last tidbit I always do on this piece here because we have our note there, there's our note, regardless of what we're putting in there. If you're not using it at all, at least you could document what sort of transpires on that phone call if you're communicating with the customer with that new note feature. Um, so just something to be mindful of, kind of the last piece of that. Um, but that's kind of what I got for you on the call log here. Just that's, that's crazy good. So in Indianapolis, Matt, I have a lot of Salesforce friends. <clears throat> Salesforce, I don't know how many billion dollars it is now, but they talk about occasionally features in Salesforce. And I'm like, Hold my beer. Service assistant did that five years ago. <clears throat> it is really, really a powerful tool. I want to tell you about three ways I used call log that was really transformational. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm in trouble getting the bugs out this Wednesday morning. One was for quality assurance calls. So we would, Matt runs 20 stops today. We would export those 20 stops to a call log. Matt, Monday, Wednesday, 421. And then we wouldn't call all of your customers, but we might call two a day and just say, did he sweep the walk? Did um, he put the flag in the lawn? Did he identify any problems? <clears throat> it wasn't the act of our calling the customers. It was the act that Matt knew we were calling the customers and that two of my calls every day, we're going to get a random check. The quality overall improved. So I loved setting up proactive service calls we called them QA service calls. The next one we did, and this was one of the most meaningful drivers of retention, especially in the spring. The number one reason customers cancel in the spring, one, you didn't get there in time because they're expecting you to come right out. If you're using LawnBot, they're getting sold, they're getting treated right away. But it was weeds. And you know, Matt, there's only so much you can control about the weeds, right? You go out and treat them, it rains that day. The neighbor doesn't have any type of service. Their seeds blow over. But we would, in most parts of the country, do a QA follow-up call. And we use TCN. You can use Captivated as well to say, if we did a service call for weeds, we would take those service calls when we applied a product that was a weed control. And two weeks later, 14 days, 21 days in Florida, because it took longer, are you starting to see the weeds curl? They want to know that you're following up on those weeds. Most customers will say, give us a call if you still have a problem. But for you to reach out proactively, and during this time of year, about 20% of customers said, yeah, I do still have it. So did it generate an additional service call? You bet. But it really moved the dial on cancels for this period of the year. So I loved that, the follow-up service call. And then the, I used it a lot for collections. I mean, all different types of collections activity um, to, to make those follow-ups. It's just so powerful. We could spend a half day boot camp on call log um, and all the inbound options just to ensure that you've got an airtight process for communication. Doing what you say you're gonna do starts with calling customers back when you say you're gonna call them back or following up on actions. And so everything you showed us today allows our customers to provide better service. It does. Yes, it does. And on the, we do, like if you were to take collections under your own wing, works excellent for that. But again, if you're going to go that route, scripting, whatever that path is going to be is important. If, if you don't get the callbacks, everybody has that initial mindset where we start with this status and then the goal is we're going to reach the customer. But then when you don't reach the customer, they're not calling you back. What is your process there? And those are the ones that you often see sort of 
fall to the wayside. Essentially, you reached out, you tried to do this, and then those remain stagnant. And then they're still status three in July. Um, and then we're still in this estimate status. We haven't done the appropriate actions there. We still have an open call log for them. So it's just whatever sort of your frequency is to kind of review these. But if you keep that process concrete from the start, there's not much of an audit after the fact is in regards to your general call logs there. Obviously, you could still do sort of your QA piece on top of that, which I think is excellent there. But scripting that path, so, so important. It really is. Well, you've heard of closed loop marketing. This is closed loop customer service, Matt, using service assistant. It is. It is. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next week with something really cool. Thank you. Thank you.